Welcome to the Church of Ethernet. Today, <laughs> hallelujah. hallelujah, can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? I can't believe I just did that. And it's on video. And it's on video. This better not go viral on YouTube. Um, so, uh, Chief Ethernet Evangelist, why, why do I use a title like that? Well, you know, let me go over my industry involvement first of all. So, and I, and I hate to, to do this, but it kind of gives you an idea of, of the involvement and, and how much effort and activity is going on right now in the Ethernet industry. So, let me take a deep breath. I am chairing the, oh my God, this is, okay, I'm going to have to change this. It's no longer a study group. I am chairing the task force that's going to be doing 100 gig across backplanes and copper cables. I am chairing an effort that is doing an industry bandwidth assessment. I am the chairman of the Ethernet Alliance, and I was the chair of the former task force that developed 40 and 100 gig. Okay, so that's in recent history, and it doesn't go back further. I have been involved in the Ethernet industry since 99 um, in a lot of different ways. At one point, I was uh, really just the, the guy working on backplanes when there was something called Zowie, and we needed to show interoperability. That was my uh, birth, my baptism into the Ethernet industry. Um, and I never in my wildest dreams imagined that I would be up here today saying that I'm doing all of these activities. All right, so um, Ethernet is just growing leaps and bounds in, in lots of different ways, and we'll talk a lot about that today. But with all of that said, I am not here today to speak on behalf of these organizations. Anything you hear me say today is this preacher's opinion, okay? So uh, I'm not here on behalf of either of those organizations. So in order for us to look to the future, as always, we need to look to the past. And part of that, I think, explains the evolution of the thinking of, of Ethernet. So six years ago, when I, when I started the effort to, to go do something beyond 10 gig, which is how we phrased it at that time, uh, someone came up and said, why? why? Why do you need something like this? Now, if we go back six years, 10 gig really wasn't taking off in the sort of volumes that most people associate with a successful Ethernet spec, i.e., they think gigabit Ethernet, they think about all the connections to, the RJ, to, the, to your laptops and RJ45s and all the switching that we have to do that. And at that time, Ethernet wasn't, 10 gig was not taking off in the same sort of volumes that gigabit Ethernet was. Plain, simple fact. And it was interesting because when, you, when, we, when we had these discussions in the group, the question was asked, was the 10 gig project a success? Was 10 gig a success? Now, Doug, I see you shaking your head yes. You're looking at it from a networking perspective. You're looking at it from the value that it brings, right? So when I asked that very question to my then study group, I was amazed to find that it was split down the middle. Half the people did not think that 10 gig was a success at that point. The other half couldn't believe that because of how it had revolutionized networking. So why? You know, and why was this group then talking about why do we need more? Well, it's very simple. It's aggregation, right? So when you're looking at aggregation, you're looking at the value that 10 gig brings to you. But I'm not getting 10 gig to my desktop yet, right? So I'm not seeing the millions and millions of ports that are happening where you are with gigabit ethernet. So if you were judging on how many ports you shipped, you didn't see it. So we started to go down this track of, okay, well, the key to why we need more than 10 gig is aggregation. Okay, that's the killer app, aggregation. Well, where is aggregation? And that's the, that's the punchline. Aggregation is everywhere. And when we started to look at the data for why people needed more than 10 gig, we came to the conclusion that it's a distributed problem throughout the entire ecosystem. We saw it first in the carriers, the internet exchanges, and the switch vendors, and the router vendors. All of these people came up saying, we need this. My company, Force 10, then um, had me pushing this effort, right? And, and you saw the other switch vendors jump in um, because everybody recognized what we were seeing at that time because 
10 gig was moving. Gig was growing leaps and bounds in, in data centers. Um, we had people like individuals from Facebook and, and Google coming in saying, I can justify 100 gig today solely on the aggregation of gigabit ethernet. Okay, We had examples in the broadband access networks of it. Um, we had information from Yahoo, I think it was Yahoo Pacific, I don't remember the exact title, where they had offered a service of streaming classic baseball games. They had capped the service at 40 gig. It saturated. They don't really know what the true demand was for it. Okay, so we had examples like this throughout, throughout everywhere. Content networks, the enterprise networks, the research networks. And people were looking at using lag, okay, link aggregation. So you basically combine 10 gig pipes. But there are problems with that, especially when you have large data sets. Um, you, if you send too much traffic down one pipe, you bring down the capacity of that virtual link, essentially. And people were saying, okay, well, in some cases, lag can work, and people have been using it successfully. But it becomes a management problem, and it becomes a, a, a OPEX problem when you have to troubleshoot a link based on lag. Because we had people talking about 8 to 16, 32 links of 10 gig that they wanted to lag together in the near future. All right? So there were real problems there. So from an ecosystem perspective, something beyond 10 gig was, was needed everywhere. All right? But as I pointed out, there were differences of opinions in what that should be. People who were judging on ports, so people who are interested in desktops, in blade servers, in servers, well, 100 gig was a very big leap. The server community wasn't going to be able to leverage that, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so we had a lot of debates going on in terms of where it was going to be. So when we jump to a new speed of Ethernet, or really a new speed period, it's not solely an Ethernet problem. Right? And you'll see a lot of people who recognized that we live in an ecosystem and all the networks need to work together. And all the standards bodies need to work together. So in this case, I've talked about data center land, but the reality is it's, it's any networking problem. Just take, for example, in, in data centers, you've got 802.1, which does the, the protocols in architecture. You've got 802.3. You've got T11 doing fiber channel storage. You have the OIF doing their stuff. You have the SFF committee that works on the modules that are going to plug into these systems. We have a new one called the CFP MSA. You've got the IETF. Um, yeah, I should add the ITU there as well. Right? And the efforts aren't just merely, OK, how do we make things go faster? Right? You're seeing a lot of things happening like with data center protocols, fiber channel over Ethernet, Rocky, e, iWarp. The protocols themselves start to come into it. Organizational types, it's, it's across the board. You've got standards. You've got SIGs. You've got trade organizations and alliances, which I'll talk a little bit about later, um, which are providing marketing education, all right? as well as then focusing in on interops. Standards bodies aren't doing the, aren't doing the interops in general. Okay? So I think there are some that, that do that. But in general, in, from, an, from an Ethernet perspective, the IEEE has not worked on interops. It's always been the, the, the work of a third-party alliance, fast Ethernet alliance, gigabit Ethernet alliance, 10 gigabit Ethernet Alliance, and now the Ethernet Alliance. We also have MSAs, all right? And MSAs are multi-source agreements. So this is where people get together. They agree on the mechanics. They agree on the interface, agree on all of the connectors, and we build modules that everybody can, that can use. All these groups work together, or try to. I see some, some, some smirks out there, but it really is a lot of interaction. Um, one example that I can give you is right now there's a lot of push in the industry to do 25 gig electrical signaling, okay? Because for a long time we worked on 10 gig, and that's no longer fast enough. Now we have to work on 25 gig. There were efforts at the Ethernet Alliance, in a, in a, in a, we had an industry forum called the Technology Exploration Forum where we had a lot of people in a room of about 130, about three quarters of the people raised their hand and said, we need to do more than 10 gig. We need to start 25 gig. That went into people discussing it going into the IEEE, which then went back to the OIF. The OIF liaisoned with the IEEE. 
T11, which does fiber channel, InfiniBand. And now there's a new project in the IEEE that will leverage their work. So it's very incestuous. A lot of interaction going on between all of that. And the MSAs, well, the MSAs are, are really pushing a lot of work back into the IEEE. So you're going to see a lot more of IEEE involved in, in developing interfaces that are then going to be used by MSAs all right, to promote interoperability. So with that as my general introduction in this, into this, I'm going to go down through these different efforts. And let's take a, just a quick second to go over them. So we're going to talk about the, the 100 gig backplane and copper cable. We're going to talk about next gen 100 gig optics. We're going to talk about optical MSA efforts. We're going to talk about a project in the OIF that's called the multi-link gearbox. And then finally, I'm going to talk about something near and dear to my heart, the Ethernet bandwidth assessment ad hoc. Where are we going in the future with bandwidth? Okay. Um, I can tell you, when I was chairing the, the 100 gig, the 4100 gig project, individuals from the end user community were coming in and, and saying, we need 100 gig. They were very clear about that. We needed 100 gig. That was their original take. But all of those presentations were then augmented with the final conclusion that as soon as you finish 100 gig, you need to get started on the next speed. All right. So as we're looking to the past to find our way to the future, we need to realize that the groundwork to the next speed will be based on what's happening in 100 gig today. So how many people in here have actually ever opened up the Ethernet 802.3 specification. Which volume? Six volumes. Six volumes of work and still growing. The reason why I bring that up is I kind of captured it all in this one slide. <laughs> and sometimes that really scares me to see your life so summarized. But that is a lot of what is covered in the 802.3 specification. It has developed interfaces and, and physical specifications that have done multiple speeds, rates up the, the y-axis, for multiple reaches, the x-axis. We started, Twisted Pair was really the big one, got us going, yeah, woohoo! We have Twisted Pair fans, I hear. So. That's good. I'm sure you're excited about the 10 gig stuff. But you know what you, what you do see there is a branching out. So early on, there was a lot of work looking in at the twisted pair, looking at, at in the coaxial, uh, which is funny. It's coming back up again. Voice grade copper, multimode fiber, all this stuff. And it was focused in on that one area. But with Ethernet success and branching out into new markets, there's been a growth in what people have expected Ethernet to do. So it goes from essentially zero inches today for the electrical interfaces all the way up to 40 and 80 kilometers. And it's still growing. <coughs> you, you'll notice that in general, things don't go away. Once you develop it, it sticks, and then people expect the next speed. So base T, 10 meg, 100 meg, gig, 10 gig, all developed. And there's talks now about 40 gig as well. Um, backplanes. Backplane actually kind of started at 10 gig, but we went back and, and did gig as well. So we developed a spec that would do gig and 10 gig and actually laid the groundwork for doing 40 gig. And now today, I'm working on 100 gig. Chip to chip and chip to module interfaces. Okay, at the at the component level, essentially, 10 gig. Now people looking at it for 40, 100. We've developed those interfaces. We're looking at making them better, smaller, because right now your 100 gig interfaces is a by 10 interface. So, I promise I won't go too geek on you, techno geek with all that stuff. Keep it at a high level with just simple numbers. I don't want big wide interfaces. You know, I, I think from a coding perspective, sometimes you guys want by 16, by 32, 64, 128. From a physical layer perspective, you never really want that because it adds pins and that has a cost implication. So you try to make things smaller 
And that's where a lot of things are going with Ethernet. Um, backplanes, we've stayed at one meter. We're going there. You'll notice, though, with Twin Axe, we started off at 15 meters. Well, actually, I'm sorry, 15 meters was the 10 gig. I don't recall the, the gig speeds, what the reach on there was on there. But it's going down now. All right, so at 40 gig and 100 gig, based on a by 10 interface, it's 7 meters. As we're looking at it for a, a, using a by 25 or a by 4 interface based on 25 gig, we're looking at bringing it down to 5 meters. Is there really a market for that? Well, we'll talk about that. I think I see Doug shaking his head yes, and I think many of us look at top of rack type configurations today and think three meters would be very good. And copper is still a cheap alternative. The uh, twisted pair we talked about, the multi-mode fiber started off in the kilometer reach, went down to the 220 to 300 meter reach, now down at 40 gig, in 100 gig on a by 10 interface at 100 meters over OM3, 150 meters over OM4. As we look to go to a, using by 25 gig Vixels, that whole reach debate is being revisited. Because to make these things work, you know, I just damn physics. That's, physics really screws things up for us. You know, if it wasn't for physics, we could do these things. <laughs> it is a problem, right? So um, there are ways to overcome the physics. But that comes at a cost, be it power, complexity, latency. So you know what we're seeing is, is that in some cases, applications have different needs. All right? So you may see more branching out. So there are, there are discussions underway right now where people are looking at a by 25 interface and saying, well, you know, I only need it for 30 meters. In a data center, that's an end of row configuration. That really supports a lot. And when I talk later about what's happening in the MSAs, if I laid down a groundwork to you that says you could, in theory, get 160 10 gig ports off a single blade, would that be exciting to some people? Okay, you know, most times when people talk about racks today, they get excited about, you know, okay, we're at 48 ports, yay! 128, yay! No, 160, it's doable, you can see it, and I'll, I'll lay down the groundwork for you on that. So, a lot of discussions on the multimode fiber. Single mode fiber, same sort of thing happening there. Now, what is interesting, and, and wow, I'm just jumping around here talking about this stuff, but remember, to go and do an Ethernet speed, you do not have to be serial. And I think that's a, that's a misnomer. A lot of people think you always have to run serial. Really? We talked about the gigabit link that you're using on your desktops. That's not serial. That's using a by 4 con configuration. It's the same thing with 10G base T. So we're starting to go into wider parallel paths. And we have to deal with the physics associated with that. In the case of multi-mode fiber, we're using a parallel approach. In the case of single-mode fiber, we're using Lambda approach, WDM. Also looking at PON, right? passive optical networking. Millions of ports being shipped on this. Right? So this is Ethernet from a networking perspective. Let's also keep in mind is that Ethernet has branched off into other places. And you know, I, I don't have any slides on this, but it is a discussion that I'd like to have later on and when we get through this that Ethernet is going into markets that are not your traditional IT. However, are you guys as IT people going to have to worry about the ramifications? OK, so I have to go a little bit standards geek on you, just a little bit, not too much. Um, this is the standard stack that we show when we talk about Ethernet architectures. Okay? For me, from an Ethernet perspective, this makes my life a lot easier to try to talk to people. You, however, are probably going to be looking at this like it's Chinese. Different language altogether. Let me try to, to, to sum it up. From an Ethernet perspective, we're really focused in on that phi area. And there's three layers in particular. There is the PCS, or the physical coding sublayer, the physical medium attachment sublayer, PMA, and the PMD sublayer. Okay. The PMD sublayer is what actually drives the different medias. Okay. Right? So you need all of that. In the case of the 4100 gig project, we knew, just given all of the things that were going on in the discussions, that we had to come up with an architecture that was going to be flexible to live 
into the future. All right? So we put a lot of work into the PCS and PMA concepts, and we've built something that it is very elegant in its simplicity. So when you talk about the PCS, you're, you're talking about that first layer really near the Mac. When we're bringing stuff down from the Mac, you're really conceptually bringing down a 100 gig serial stream. Okay? So what we do in the PCS is three steps. We do the encoding, which we use a 64B, 66B encoding. Send those words down. The 64-bit words become 66-bit words. We then go into the second step, which is multi-lane distribution. Remember I said it's all parallel, right? So we send and break up for a 100 gig stream. We break it up into what we call 20 PCS lanes, all right? That's, we had to come up with a nomenclature. So, and we do this in a round-robin fashion. So PCS lane 1, 2, 3, 4. In the case of 100 gig, it goes to 20. In the case of 40 gig, there's only four. We also add alignment blocks, all right? And this will help later on for de-skewing when you're sending all of this stuff down. And then the third step is in the receiver PCS is the, the, the alignment and the static skew compensation. That's really the heart of the PCS in a very high-level summary. Encode it, break it up, multi-lane distribute it. In the PMA sublayer, well, that's really where you adapt the PCS lanes to what you're going to be driving. All right, so I talked before about the different types of interfaces that we have, but when we were doing this project and we were do working on the architecture, we didn't know what the solutions were going to be. In addition, we didn't know what the future was going to hold. We could speculate. What I mean by this is when you start to look at 100 gig, we were seeing proposals for 10 by 10. Some people talked about 5 by 20. Some people talked about 4 by 25, 2 by 50, 1 by 100. As much as I enjoy standards efforts, I did not want to have to come back each time to develop a new spec for each of these. We wanted to develop something that was going to be flexible and scalable. So 20, 10, 5, 4, 2, 1. Those were all the different lane counts. We chose 20 PCS lanes. Does anybody want to fathom a guess why we chose 20 PCS lanes? Least common denominator, right? So we would be able to adapt to whatever might be developed. 10 by 10 for electrical interfaces, 4 by 25 for optics, or 5 by 20. So really what happens in the PMA layer, think about it like a gearbox. It adapts to whatever you need from the lane count perspective. So the PCS combined with the PMA is the real key, the mojo, the hallelujahs, amen, to the, the 100 gig architecture. The PMD sublayer, well, that's specific to what you're trying to drive. Right there is the, is the key, okay? So from a 4100 gig specification, this is what exists today. There's been two projects, the 802.3BA project and the 802.3BG project that developed all of these different specifications. We've got a backplane at 40 gig. We've got a, cap, a copper cable at 40 and 100 gig based on by 10. We've got multimode fiber solutions, 40 and 100 gig parallel fibers based on a by 10 configuration. Single mode fiber, well, we have 40 gig FR which is two kilometers. This is really more for the carrier client access where they want to have a single type of thing that maps over at OC768 so you can have one module support multiple standards. For 10 kilometers, we have LR4 specifications. In the case of 40 gig, it's a 4 by 10. In the case of 100 gig, it's a 4 by 25. And we also have a 40 kilometer solution for single mode fiber also based on a 4 by 25 which is essentially the same thing as the LR4, but it's got an optical amplifier in it. All right? That's what exists today. The family's growing, and I've talked a lot about this already. I'm working on the backplanes, so currently there isn't a 100 gig specification for backplanes, so that'll be 4 by 25. We'll have a twin axial solution, so we're jumping from a 10 by 10 to a 4 by 25. The plan there, or the thought is, is that, that that solution that that gets developed to support backplanes and twin axials 
Copper cables will essentially be the same, though that may not work out that way. The next gen um, 100 gig optical study group is looking at developing, obviously, optics. But really, part of what, how that group was formed was it wanted, we wanted to come up with lower cost, lower power, higher density solutions. And part of the way that we can do that is to get away from a 10 by 10 interface and go to a 4 by 25 electrical interface. So the optics group is also looking at developing chip to chip and chip to module electrical interfaces. OK, so from a backplane perspective, there's a lot of pressure on the backplanes. How many people are familiar with what the backplanes are? I guess I shouldn't make that assumption. Right? It's what everything plugs into. All right. So when we were looking at this, and we started to calculate what we could achieve in terms of backplanes, we started off first looking at the faceplates. All right? And that, those are the four pictures on the left. Now, these are similar size cards. And we loaded them up either with SFP pluses, the QSFPs, the CFPs or the CXPs, and we looked at varying speeds from 10 gig to 100 gig. In the point of uh, picture A, you could fit 48 SFP ports on a single card in this configuration, 480 gig today. Today. Card B is the 40 gig solution, 1.76 terabit today. Four ports of CFP at 100 gig. Now, this one's kind of ironic, isn't it? 100 gig solution, going 10 kilometers, or using this form factor designed to support the 10 and 40 kilometers. Well, we can get 400 gig. And then if you go to the CXP module, which is for only for the multi-mode fiber, you could fit 32 ports, or 3.2 terabit. Big numbers. All right. Now look at this from a backplane perspective. You know, at the t at, in its day, a five terabit backplane was a big deal. When you take into account these configurations, and you look at different size systems, depending on eight or fourteen line cards, those were the examples that we chose. Five terabits on the low end of where you need to be. All right. And yeah, I know a lot of you are probably laugh and going, "Well, we're not going to have that sort of data." Well, there was a time when people thought 10 gig would be enough, and it's not. It's sort of like memory. You can always use more. So we looked at this from a backplane configuration, and, and we, we looked at different fabric approaches, and we looked at it based on 10 gig or, or 25 gig electrical signaling, and we chose a switch capacity. Actually, we plotted it over multiples, but just look at 10 terabit, which is where the, the cross lines are. In the case of running it at 10 gig, you need... 1,200 to roughly 2,000 pair to come up with something to do, what you need to do a 10 terabit system. If you run it at 25 gig, you're down in the 500 to 800 pair count. Much more manageable. You just have to make it go faster. Right? So from a switching perspective, it was a big deal. From a blade server perspective, it's a huge deal. Okay. Now, this chart that I'm showing is actually the chart that was used by the, the task force study group to do 100 gig. And what we found was that there were different applications, and they're growing at different bandwidth rates. Okay. In the case of the red line shown here, that's network aggregation. It's doubling about every 18 months on average. This was based on the data that we saw at that time. Okay. The processors, the servers, well, they have to deal with Moore's Law. Right? So their capability is growing at a slower rate. And in general, you look at it, and it's a doubling about every 24 months. Now, if we take a step back, remember I said everybody thought that Gigabit Ethernet, that was a successful project. It had lots of good volumes. When you look at these two curves, and you see how relatively close they are in terms of two years? It's like, OK, well, that makes a lot of sense. When you look at it in the case of 10 gig, well, there's a five-year difference there. And you know, this is a projection. And I, I think we're still working to get 10 gig to, to LOM applications um, where it's going to grow even further. But you can see there, OK, well, there's two different camps of really using 10 gig. Maybe this is why people had that 
that uh, viewpoint of whether 10 gig was a success or not. And at 100 gig, well, it's even further. So it's, it's 2018, 2017, 2018, when we ex anticipate needing 100 gig blade servers. So uh, why are we worried about backplanes then to support 100 gig? Well, when you guys spend your money, you want to spend it for more than one generation, right? ROI. I don't think you guys want to keep going back to your management saying, hey, we need more money, we need a new system. So what, Pete, what we see is that we've got to develop this way in advance so that the infrastructure that's put in place, i.e., the, the blade server enclosures that you're buying in the 2014 phase will then be upgradable in the future. Right? So we're not targeting 100 gig blade servers reality. We're targeting the backplanes that are going to support those blade servers to make sure that they're going to be upgradable in the future. From a cable reach perspective, well, if you're looking at a top of rack, you're going to have three meters is really a, a good number that can address a lot of them. If you're looking at inter-rack, well, five meters is going to also help address a meaningful portion. Right? So we're looking at those two from the cable reach. For the next gen optics, well, as I said, the electrical interfaces, and once uh, a few more slides, I'll, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. The multi-mode PMDs using four by 25 gig optics, well, what sort of reaches can we do? The simple, uh, I'm sorry, single mode PMDs. Really, what we're trying to do here is to reduce the cost, the power, and raise the density. So perhaps, Something other than 10 kilometers is something that we could look at, maybe 500 meters to 2 kilometers. Right? If anybody has any meaningful data in terms of their reach needs, please see me, because the study group is working on this issue right now. That group started in September of this year. Um, one of my friends, actually a guy direct report, is the vice chair of that group. And we're hoping to have these issues resolved in the March or July time frame to be actually begin the project. Because from an IEEE perspective, there's a study group where you say, this is what we're going to study, this is what we need, and then you go into the project phase, the task force phase. All right, so let, let's dive into the form factors for a little bit. There, there are three primary form factors out there today that go into all of these systems. You've got the CFP, which can use support anything. You've got the CXP, which is really targeting the short-reach multimode fiber and the copper cables. And then you have the industry darling QSFP which is right now targeting 40 gig. Multi-mode fiber, single-mode fiber, and copper cables. That's our toy box today. Let's look at this in terms of perspective and dimensionally. CFP, it's big. CXP, still big, but you can get some really good densities there, and then the QSFP which everyone likes, and they're using it for 40 gig. Interesting story a friend told me. So when you look at the CFP module, it's not that, that different from this. And he was doing a teleconference, and he was, I think it was over with a gentleman from Asia, and he was pointing out the CFP module, and he held up his phone as an example. I think it was his Blackberry. And he goes, well, it's about this big. And everyone's like, oh my god, that's huge. And he was going, well, it's smaller than the, the 10 gig, 300 pin MSA. No, 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 not that. Your phone, it's so huge. <laughs> it's always a matter of perspective, right? So, um, however, it does have impacts then on cost, power, and density. CFP in its day was made that big for a reason, and we'll explain a little bit more now. CXP, well, that really came out of InfiniBand. Um, I think this one's a little bit slower than what we want. To, to see happen. Um, the QSFP, though, is really getting a lot of attention. All right? And people are using 40 gig now, not just in the ways that I described before, where we were looking at using 40 gig primarily for the server applications. We're now seeing that there is a home for 40 gig in networking. Right? And people are using it because it is hitting a nice cost point right now. It's leveraging 10 gig technology. So from a cost perspective, a power perspective, it's doable today. It's not, not new technology reaches. Um, you're seeing group companies such as my own coming out with switches based on the QSFP. And the interesting thing about the QSFP 
and some of these solutions is, is that you can use it in a 40 gig mode or you can use it in a 4 by 10 gig mode. Those are not the same thing. I'm, I'm talking about them in different terms. You can talk about a 40 gig payload coming over there, one single link, or you can talk about four independent 10 gig links. So the technology is now driving port density. CFP in the MSA is, they're working with industry. They understand that the current CFP module is too big. It's a first generation. Just like 10 gig had its 300 pin MSA, we have CFP. But they've already laid out a roadmap to get down to a module that will be able to support the 100 gig LR specifications. Right? And that, this is different, and, and some people say, well, why, why not use QSFP? Well, it's those pesky laws of physics again. You've got to be able to get all the heat out. So from a QSFP perspective, you're going to see a home for the QSFP in some applications, but it doesn't fit all of them. The technology isn't there right now where it's running cool enough to get all the power out of the QSFP. So let's, let's spend a moment here and try to understand why. Why are we going down this evolutionary path? Well, first of all, it's evolutionary. That's human nature, right? We just keep building on what we have. When you look at the top picture, you're looking at the first generation CFP type module. It's based on a 10 by 10 interface. So that 100 gig link is being carried in on 10 pairs running at 10 gig in each direction. You go into a gearbox. Remember I talked about the PMA sublayer. So that converts the 10 lanes to four lanes for the optics. Then you're going into the different optical stuff and then the, the MUX and DMUX optically. Okay. Well, when you look at those gearbox ICs, first generation parts, six watts for just the gearbox in one direction. Okay, so when you're looking at that first generation, your power range down in the bottom ranged anywhere from 8 to 32 watts, depending on what module family, what PMD you were trying to support. Okay? So, what's a very simple way to get the power out of the module? Get rid of the PMA sublayer, get rid of that gearbox. So we're working on pulling that out. All right? And then you're going to see some optical integration happen. And then finally, you'll see even more integration happen optically. We'll go down to a, a different type of interface. Your, your big chips will be 25 gig native, so you won't need to do any 10 to 4 conversions. You'll be saving power there. So a three-step approach. The module for CFP, then the CFP2, and then CFP4. It's nice to have a roadmap. Um, how many of you are familiar with the 10 gig form factor wars? Did you ever count how many there were? I think there's seven. So there's the 300 pin MSA, the 200 pin MSA, ZenPack, XPack, X2, XFP, SFP Plus, eight. All right? So with a lot of foresight, um, getting it down to three in an evolution path is, is, a, is a big win. All right? I, th I think all of us have a tendency to think, okay, we don't want to go through those X wars, and we don't. But the reality is, is that there is going to be evolution, and technology will make the solutions better. And that's what we're seeing here happen. So we also have this other project running over in the OIF, which has a lot of potential for promise in terms of packaging density for 10 gig. Okay, so we're going to be developing a 4x25 electrical interface. We have 10x10 10 10 interfaces, but we also could have 10 independent 10 gig links that we would like to leverage the packaging density that 4x25 brings. All right, so I'm not talking running 10x10 10 10 for 100 gig now, I'm talking about 10 independent 10 gig lanes and being able to run those over a 4x25 link. When you look at the, uh, the, the IEEE architecture, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the PCS with, adding, with putting in the alignment markers, which there's a basic assumption that those 10, la those ten lanes are, are bonded together. 
The MLG project is taking in, in addressing the application where you have 10 independent links that you want to try to run over this 4 by 25. It'll help us with port density. All right, so remember I said before 160 10 gig links? So right, the CFP4 module is about one fourth the size of a CFP module. So I could fit four of them in that space. And remember, our, our plot showed four CFP modules. So if I now have that broke out into 10, let's see, 10 links in a CFP4, four CFP4s in a CFP space, that's 40, four modules per blade, 160. Right? So the packaging density that the technology is bringing looks very promising. And when we start to talk about these mega data centers, it's going to be a problem. And now we're going to be talking about putting that into a very high density situation. So a lot of, uh, a lot of potential promise here for the 10 by 10, uh, well, support for 10 independent 10 gig links and the MLG project. And by the way, we're already doing this. This sort of packaging scheme is already being used, and I talked about that. You know, our, our, our switch the QS, uh, uses a QSFP, but then you use an octopus cable, you fan it out, and now you're using, bringing in four 10 gig links into that 40 gig QSFP. Or you can use it in a native 40 gig mode. All right, so from a packaging density perspective, yay, we're getting there. It's not necessarily about just leveraging smaller packages. It's now looking at how much can you get into a single package. And it's being, it's being impacted by development in photonic integration. It's being impacted by increases in speed. And it's being impacted by reducing the form factor size. These are all the toys now that we have. So spending a lot of time trying to get 100 gig down in terms of cost, power, getting density up. But the industry, as I already said, is looking for that next rate of Ethernet. Why? So I, I don't know. How many people in here actually track their own network bandwidth? How much you're actually using on a regular basis? OK. Are you seeing exponential growth or not really? Well, I can tell you there are a lot of people out there who are. And when you project, remember we talked about the, this cur these curves before, you start to project outward. You got people who say they need terabit in 2015. Actually, if you talk to somebody from Google, they've actually already stated publicly they need terabit in 2013. The reality. Um, but we are dealing with physics again. So there really is a concern with the technical feasibility of, of actually developing a terabit link. Because right? everybody just assumes with Ethernet it's a 10x link, 10x increase. Though my project broke that. Right? We had a 4x increase and a 10x increase. So there's a lot of debate going on right now about is the next speed of Ethernet going to be 400 gig or is it going to be terabit? Well, it depends on which side of the fence you want to talk to. If you want to talk to the people who have to, the suppliers who have to make it work, a lot of those people are saying 400 gig is the next logical jump. But when you talk to the people who need to put in the links and need to invest, they're saying terabit. Now, we've got to be fair here. They're saying terabit in the absence of any cost data to go along with that. You know, let's face it, we're all in, in this to make money. And if we develop something that nobody buys, then we haven't really done our job right. And remember, the economics of the application are going to dictate the solution. So yeah, we can come up with a solution. But if it doesn't meet the cost target, then we haven't done our job, as I just said. I've talked about our toolbox and what we have. Let's consider those options. So we have time division multiplexing. Let's go faster. We've got modulation. Let's add more symbols per second. We can do WDM, at least optically. Or we can add more fibers, space division multiplexing. OK, well, think about it. Let's go faster. Laws of physics, power. Modulation, power issues, latency issues. Optical lambdas, well, for copper, I think that one's obvious. Um, however, there are limits of how many lambdas that you can get on a single fiber. And adding fibers or conductors. Well, this is an option, but as I said before, wider isn't always good. And in some cases, uh, you know, for carriers, that's not always a, a, a real plus because nobody wants to go and lay new fiber. All right. So 
Think about that, but now think about the bit rate that you try to target and look at it from a parallel approach. Remember I said the road to, um, to the next speed is, is based on what's happening now because that's going to be the technology that we have available for us to use in the future. 10 gig is what we had to use when we developed 100 gig. Now we're developing 25 gig for 100 gig. So that's really going to be the basis of what's available in the industry and what the industry invests in for the next few years. Do the math. Right? So for 400 gig at 25 gig, you need 16 lanes in each direction. Now, that's not necessarily a showstopper. There is precedent for doing it before. It's not pretty. We had the 300 pin MSA. That was based on a by 16 interface. But go and look at that for terabit. At 25 gig, you would need 40 pair, 40 lanes in each direction. That's ugly. And quite honestly, I don't know too many people who want single link cards. Usually two, at least four. Well, at least two, preferably four. 25 gig just doesn't get us into that next speed of terabit. So we got a real problem here from an industry perspective that's being discussed right now. And we're trying to move from 400 gig to terabit. Now, part of the problem that we ran into when we were developing the 100 gig was not recognizing that there were these different bandwidth growths. And I like to learn from my mistakes. So what we're doing right now is we went to the 802, and we got them to charter an ad hoc that is doing an evaluation of industry bandwidth needs. Not technical solutions, just information gathering. I am not proud to say that I am the owner of the longest study group in 802.3 history. Okay. Some of that might have been averted had we been doing our homework more up front during the consensus building phase to, to truly understand what the bandwidth growths were. So we're, we're trying to learn, and we're trying to make sure that that happens and get the information now. So we've been, for the past year, we've been going out and we've been talking to various people in the industry to get updates in terms of what their bandwidth needs are. This kind of puts it in perspective. So when you develop a new speed, that development cycle is not done solely in a standards body. All right? Does everyone get that? It's a very key point. It's not like, well, the IEEE has decided we're going to do 100 gig. No, no, no. That's not how it works. You need to have belief that you can do it. You need to have belief that there's a market to do it. So there's a lot of pre standardization work that happens. Now, I, I don't know exactly when 100 gig and the desire for a higher speed started. What I can say is, is that I did sit in a meeting in the IEEE during 10 gig back in 2001 where we did have a discussion about next speeds. So when we talk about 40 gig and 100 gig, that work was going on for a very long time, quite honestly, prior to any standardization efforts. Now, what I can say is, is that I do know on December 5th, 2005, remember it because it's my wife's birthday. Hi, honey, I got to take this phone call first. Was really the first industry discussion of getting started on the next speed, right? It took us eight months from that point to get to a point of consensus to go and get the study group chartered by the IEEE. From there, it took us, oh, another. 16 to 18 months to get chartered to become a task force. Roughly two years. I want to try to cut down that time because there is exponential growth happening and we're not going to have the time to mess around and go off with this. We really need to be able to react to the market need quicker. So if I can cut a year out of that time frame, that's great because you know what? When you look at the rest of that schedule, we only had one slip during the entire time and that was during developing what the goals for the task force were. All the technical work was done on schedule, no slip whatsoever. And it was a very huge project. So the BWA ad hoc that I'm chartering is really going to help us in this point of phase of that two years up front for developing the need to then showing that there is broad market potential. And I kind of just touched on this. you know. How many people think that the IEEE makes decisions? Because when you read the press, you have people saying, ah, 
The standards process is flawed. There's a problem with it. And when we were having all the debates about 40 gig and 100 gig, oh boy, for two months, it was very intense. And I was having lots of interviews with the press. And I can't tell you how many times I was asked, do you think the standards process is broke? The standards process does not make the decisions. The standards process is just a process for those decisions to be made by the industry in a level playing field. All right, so consider this. On any given day in my, in my study group, I had people who were end users. I had equipment vendors, component vendors, optics vendors, test equipment vendors, board material vendors, consultants, and I, other people I don't want to try to name because I can't remember all of them. All those people are coming into a room. And that decision is made in that room before it goes up to the working group about anything technical. And it requires 75% or greater consensus to make a decision. How many people have ever chaired a group of any type? OK. Simple majorities can be sometimes tough, right? Look at our own government right now. <laughs> Super majority, 66%, 67%. That's really tough. 75% consensus is extremely tough. But once you make a decision, you know you've got industry buy-in to move forward. All right. So remember that. It's not a question of whether the standards process is broke. It's a question of, is there agreement, consensus in the industry to move forward in any given way? That's your real criteria. And that's where the industry needs to come together, not the standards. The standards are just the process. All right, so there's a lot of other activities going on. I'm not going to jump too much into them because it's still very early. Um, oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I put down the BK task force. I don't know if that actually is the, the, the nomenclature, but it's an extended EPON project, and I believe it was supposed to become a task force yesterday. We have a new study group that will be doing the EPON protocol, passive optical networking over coax cable. All right? Jumping that up to 10 gig, the cable industry is all over this. You guys may actually have to deal with this. This may become one of the things that you have to deal with if you're dealing with any of those organizations now for your, for your uplinks. March CFIs, and this is where I was kind of getting into some things here that Ethernet's going beyond where it currently is. First of all, there is uh, a project to do a, a longer reach 40 gig uh, optical solution. But there's also this reduced pair one gig Ethernet for automotive applications that's coming forward. So you're now starting to see Ethernet branch outside of its applications in a much bigger way. Problem is, from my perspective, and, and I don't know if you guys are even thinking about this yet, are you going to have to worry about the car being part of your? <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm being serious, right? Because you can imagine now that you can do the office is extended in the car. I know, that, I know we're not supposed to be able to talk on our phones while we're driving, but you can't have hands free. So you could imagine video conferencing to your car. Are you guys going to have to worry about that? I, I don't know. Um, for future CFIs, 40G base T, it's going to happen. I'm not sure when, but I would anticipate that is going to happen next year. Next generation power over Ethernet is another one. Some of that already exists in, in, in the market today, HD base T. Don't know how much people are using that. WDM Pond is another area that people are talking about. And optical backplanes, because remember, we're talking terabits of capacity that the backplane has to look at. So there's a lot more interest now than any other time I've ever seen in optical backplanes. And there actually is some standardization efforts and MSA efforts underway. So that looks real. So in summary, Ethernet keeps growing. Lots of, lots of new efforts underway. Um, the actual formal efforts right there that I'm work to, working on for the networking applications, big deal. There's new industry efforts. The OIF has its MLG project. The CFP has its roadmap. We're still looking at coming up with higher density 10 gig, going to 40 and 100 and even beyond. But you know what? I want to leave you with this. I have a lot of fun in standards, but unless they actually ship and make money, we haven't done our job, all right? So we need to show that there's interoperability. Remember I talked before about the EA. From a strategic vision perspective, first of all, the EA is a marketing alliance. 
But look, one of its main goals under expanding the ecosystem is to facilitate interop testing. It's a very big deal. You guys need to have belief that this stuff can, you can deploy this stuff and that it works. You don't deploy Ethernet until you know it's good enough. You don't deploy any technology until you know it's good enough. Right? And what is good enough? Well, right performance at the right cost. All right? So while the EA is focusing on the interop testing and looking to the future, it, um, the interop testing itself is a huge deal for any technology. Now, I was just at supercomputing two weeks ago. Supercomputing is about performance, right? Faster, faster, faster. At least that's kind of how I went into it with, with that belief. And with my EA chair hat on, I had to talk to analysts and, and the press. And we went over the demo that we were doing. And the demo was quite interesting in the sense that there were five demos happening simultaneously. We had multiple vendors talking 10G base T to each other. We had multiple vendors talking 40 gig, optics and electrical. We had storage, either fiber channel or over Ethernet or iSCSI. We had iWarp and Rocky running, all this running together. All of this running together. That's the key point, interoperability. So while the press was there at a show focusing in on performance, they were actually blown away by the fact that we were showing interoperability. Because interoperability breeds competition, competition drives costs down. And I think it's safe to say that, we, that in general, the world doesn't have the money that it, they thought it had a few years ago. Cost is still an issue. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to throw money at the problem because that will limit what you'll be able to do, right? So 40 gig, 10 G base T, storage, all these technologies ready for deployment. Multiple vendors there to play with. You can do best of breed systems. And with that, thank you. So. Any questions? Yeah, Paul Krizak from AMD. Um, I know you said you were going to keep this high level, and uh, that's, this it was good because uh, I even at the high level I was kind of <laughs> a little over my head there for some of that stuff. But uh, I was just wondering, just to to satisfy my internal geek, you know, what, what kind of uh, uh, technology are you seeing out there on the horizon that just really makes you go, wow? I mean, is there some, some really neat stuff that we should be looking out for? Um, you know, you're talking about things like optical backplanes. I mean, what would that even look like? And yeah. Uh, so that's a, a really good question. Um, I, I, I'm not really going wow about the technology. I'm actually doing more wow about the process, okay? Um, how many people remember the 10 gig LAN WAN wars? Do you know what I'm talking about? So if you look at the 10 gig spec, um, Ethernet said, okay, well, we're going to do a 10 gig for LAN, and we're going to do a 10 gig for WAN. But they're not really the same. Okay? And there wasn't really a lot of good communication going on between the Ethernet and, like, the ITUT. The 4100 gig project, in a sense, was transformational because we really have improved those lines. So while, I'm, while I understand your question, I'm more excited about if we can put it all together and it all works. Now, there are cool technologies coming out there. Um, you know, I will never underestimate copper. You know, when I um, joined, got my first job out of college, I was working on an FDDI fiber optic transmitter or fiber optic transceiver. And I remember clear as day saying to my father, Dad, we're doing 125 megabit. That's 125 million bits over copper or over optical fiber. We'll never do that over copper. <laughs> 20 years later, look at what I'm doing. All right, so um, I'm blown away by that in, in all honesty, but a lot of that is, is work that's been done in the past. I mean, there, there's work that you can go through the specs and, and look at um, over the past 50 years. I mean, there's stuff that I did that I found history back in 1939 that addressed the exact problem that I was dealing with, but it came practical to actually be able to implement it. So Moore's Law, yay. Um, optical integration, I think, actually is, is kind of cool, too. But in terms of blowing me away, it's not blown away until we're done with it. 
So, uh, but the fact that we have everybody working together is the thing that, that is, blows me away and is actually more important than honesty. Hi, Doug. Hi, Doug Hughes, DE Show Research, for the record. Um, so, InfiniBand um, has a lot of the same sort of electrical goals that 10 and 100 have. I mean, they have to, they have to do the same thing at the level of the physics. The physics is the same, right? You have to cram a really high signaling rate through a really small cable. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering to what extent the InfiniBand guys, mainly Mellanox, and the Ethernet guys are going to be like branching towards the same electrical spec. I know that Mellanox already does this to some extent. They can do 40 gigabit, but I'm wondering if there's going to be more sort of integrated specification development there. So what I can say, which is public record, is individuals from Mellanox sitting in my task force. Right. Okay, so they're there. Um, look, you know, this is Ethernet. I, I don't want to get into the whole IB Ethernet war. The reality is, is that certain applications will always use what they want to use, and there's still personal opinion and all of that stuff. But I think we could all agree that when Ethernet says it's going to do something, it raises more industry attention than most most others. So there's a lot of industry consensus right now in this 25 to 28 gig electrical speed, right? It's not just Ethernet and IB that's looking at it. Fiber channel for 28 gig, for 32 gig fiber channel is looking at it. You've got people who are doing implementations for ITUT that are, are looking at it. Um, so from a physical perspective, we're all investing in this same general area. Um, and electrically and optically, you're, you're seeing that sort of stuff happen. So um, there is convergence in, in that sense. Um, as my earlier example about the, uh, the branching between the different groups, EA, IEEE, OIF, and the OIF went to everybody. The OIF went to IBTA, it went to um, T11, it went to the IEEE. I don't, I don't remember if it did ITUT, but those three groups that do a lot of physical standards, they, they were all communicating. We have to. Um, I can't tell you how many times over the past 10 years where I was going to these multiple groups and it was sort of a running click, essentially. There were a lot of the same people going to each of these groups and it was, in a sense, kind of frustrating. So we, we really, as a body, have, uh, as a standards body globally, are trying to work better with each other and to leverage those technologies. But once again, remember, all applications have their own economics. And what may work fine in a router and switch may not be good for servers, which may not be good for mem uh, memory cards. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the, uh, the time. <laughs>